Thomas O'Brien, who Daniel actually was pronouncing it, he does that, but that's fine because everyone pronounces it unless you've heard it a couple of times. Um, so I grew up in New Hampshire, second generation libertarian, and I uh, um, and I was actually vice chair of the Libertarian Party from 2006 to 2008. Hey, you're here, I'm going to tell you. My, la my first name is pronounced Often. So oh, it's cool. It's oh, cool. Oh, 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 oh. Like Ave Maria, far less cool. Um, <laughs> Thank you. 
volunteers. Um, and what I learned from dealing with the Republican Party was that they cheat. You know, and I think most of us know that, and I think what, what we realized was across the country that anywhere where the, the Ron Paul folks managed to threaten the establishment, you know, the, the Republicans turned around and cheated. And when we finally got to the national convention, they cheated there too. And then they, they changed the rules for the, the 2016 convention that showed that they were going to manipulate the outcome of the events in the future. And I, I went to, I had to pull out of them, said I cannot contribute to this any further, it's a waste of time. I did my research and I found my home with the Libertarian Party, as here we all are. Um, and what, um, what I went to doing was working as the executive director for the Libertarian Party in Louisiana. And um, the first thing we worked on doing was bringing folks over to the Libertarian Party who were Ron Paul supporters to look at Gary Johnson. And you know, folks were so devastated, if you can remember in 2012 when, when Ron didn't get the nomination and where we go, well, here's Gary Johnson. And um, folks were thrilled to learn that there was somebody that they could you know, vote for. And what we, we, what we do in Louisiana is, I don't know, some states you can do this, some states you can't, but we do voter affiliation. So when you register to vote, you register with your party. Um, and so they were thrilled to learn not only can I vote for a candidate, but I can vote for a, I can change my vote registration to the attorney and belong to an organization that I believe in. Um, and of course, Gary Johnson, he, he performed the best of any, um, I think, achieved the most votes that any And what we managed to do after that, what we managed to do was to focus on the local level. Um, after the 2012 election, there were a number of folks who were so dissatisfied with Democrats and Republicans um, that we wanted to bring folks into the party and be, be, what do you do? What do you do after an election year? They're typically, the interest in politics goes down. We're going to see, you know, hopefully, um, after this, this uh, exciting election, we're going to see interest go up again, you know, on the Libertarian Party. So what we, what, what we did was we established parish executive committees across the state, um, which allowed for going into each parish and um, registering more libertarians, contacting folks who had been with the party for 20 years, who had never been contacted by other libertarians, and inviting them to come at the local level and join in and empower them to serve on committees. We also invited their friends and family members and co-workers to come in and learn what libertarianism is. Um, as we did that, we would establish committees in each parish, and I, I know you, you all know counties very likely. And um, what that did was allow for them to focus on things that are most interest, they are most interested in. You know, Ms. 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 Tang focus is, was on Common Core for, for fighting Common Core. We had some parishes who were more interested in gun rights. You know, we had some parishes that were more interested in gay marriage. So, um, so by going out and for, you know, number one, contacting registered libertarians who had never been contacted before, inviting them to come together, bringing them together around the table, and let, allowing them to introduce themselves to each other and realize, hey, there's another libertarian that lives in my town. You know, there's another libertarian I, I, that, I, that I, you know, have respect for what they're saying, or I, I agree with what they're saying. Um, and so what we did was we managed to grow the party and build a foundation for, um, for pulling in more libertarians. Um, but I'm going to cut it real short so that I can allow some, some of the other ladies to speak. Um, we established 23 parish executive committees um, with the focus being on the local level. We managed to pull in like 19 candidates. We got six or seven candidates elected. And we pulled in, we went from fundraising um, from being like among the worst in fundraising for the party to the seventh in fundraising for the party. We established parent, um, campus organizations at multiple, parent, at multiple campuses across Louisiana and um, got to work at the legislature and focused on fighting for bills um, in 2014, 2015, and we were very successful this year. So, um, you know, as, as far as activism goes, you know, that's best is the person I believe that put this panel together. And she is not here. She is the president of the Libertarian um, Women's Organization. And um, she had invited me to speak on this panel, and I 
Um, is typically something like um, 
the social, political, and economic equality of women. Now, the reason I don't love that definition is because I think equality is a really, really icky word when it comes to, like, what, what is equality? I want to be treated equally under the law. And there are things that are not in, in, within law that I think that there are issues with in terms of, like, I, I really find it annoying when somebody says, oh, women aren't good at math. Like, that, that's, that's something that, like, drives me nuts. And it's, and it's just a social, you know, it's just a social implication that, that then turns people into, you know, thinking that, like, that they have to pander to women or they have to treat women differently as a result. They're, they're a, my five-year-old niece was told recently that Star Wars is for boys, not for girls. But she loves Ray from Star Wars, and she was so mad that someone said that to her. And those are completely non-governmental issues. But I consider myself a feminist because at the end of the day, like, I love math. I worked for Peter Schiff in his financial, like, in, in, his, in his economic firm. I love economics. I love these things. And I hate the fact that someone decides that because of my gender, I'm not supposed to like these things. I'm not supposed to be encouraged in these things. And so there's a social aspect of feminism. And the problem is, is that in modern, modern feminism, there are factions of modern feminism, but there are some that are really, really toxic. One, because they instigate a debate, they, they instigate a war between men and women. And I think that that's really divisive. Um, and also because there's this new uprising of social justice culture, which creates this, this, this like having to fight for, like for, for levels of equality that don't make sense because at the end of the day, like I don't want equal, I don't want to get equal solutions if I didn't, there are equal outcomes if I didn't put in the same amount of work as someone else. And when it comes to things like affirmative action, like people talk about wanting the same number of women on a board of, a, of, of an organization, the same number of CEOs, but the fact is, I don't need anyone to decide, oh, well, women need to be more, so there need to be more female CEOs, and so we need to make more women CEOs. No, like, I, I'm perfectly happy to, like, grassroots that stuff and say, hey, I want to raise my niece or my own kids to be ambitious and want to be CEOs. But if they don't want that, I'm like, like, I think that the kind of the numerical quota sort of crap is just, it's so counter to the right of individuals to empower themselves and to be something, that whatever they want to be. I love to be a CEO. My, 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 best, my best friend would be terrible at it. That's totally fine. And we don't, need, we don't need to have the same outcomes unless we're willing to do the same work. But when it comes to people saying, oh, you can't be a CEO because you're a woman, you can't be something because you're a woman, that drives me absolutely mad. But there's, there's people that seem to conflate the two, and that bothers me because I never ever want to find out that I got a job because I was a woman. I want to find out that I got a job because I was the best damn person for the job. So my definition of feminism is a little bit, is a little bit. The one last thing I want to say on the feminism topic is that a lot of people believe that feminism and libertarianism are not compatible because we've seen a lot of very annoying feminists like, like, like say this philosophy. But Tony Nathan was the vice presidential candidate in 72 House and Tony Nathan was someone going through the feminist revolution at the time. And Tony Nathan stood up and said, we need feminism, and we need libertarianism to talk to feminists. We need, we need feminism, feminist libertarianism. And she started, in 1973, she started the Association of Libertarian Feminists, which I am a member. And we are committed to addressing <coughs> feminist issues, addressing the concerns of feminists, but doing so without enacting the state. We are doing so by saying, yeah, you know what, I see an issue. I want, I want more girls to be encouraged to go into STEM fields, whatever you want. But, and, and to be individuals and to be whomever they want to be. I don't want anyone ever told that they can't do something just because of their gender. They can't be a CEO or they can't be an astronaut. They can't be whatever the hell they want. But we have to do that socially. We have to do that as in, in a way that liberates people to be whomever they want to be, to be free, not through government. And so that's what ALF is about. Statist feminism is essentially a class war, right? But it creates a class. But, but yeah. But it, uh, it's, I imagine it's hard to say you're a feminist as an individual. Because the term feminist creates a, um, a class of people. Sure. So I can understand that you are starting to talk to feminists mm -hmm. and, and open the eyes to the point of that. 
individuality, not so this, the fem feminism is, is like any other term separates people, and that doesn't do any good for us. Even today, lots of women put up with that. Even 
ideal is a cold half the sky, right? It's not true. So when I, I just met two women from China just last month at my house. They come out tell me, could you find me a good, loyal American husband who loves Chinese culture and don't mind Chinese woman? I said, why? Because our husband won't betray us, and they run away with their concubines, they took all our money, bank account is empty. We don't care, even though that uh, I don't, we don't care if the person is rich or old, as long as they're loyal to the family. So what? Well, so you're an educated woman in China. Why can't you even not walk away and divorce them on time? It, it, to me, it's like such an inconsistency between, you know, communists provide, you know, encourage the feminism to actually the woman be truly independent in their mind, in their financial situation, and control their lives. So, so I, I do agree in terms some, um, to some extent, communist government wants women to be class group. So. It's like when we divide the old people into 10 classes, five red, five black. But they also want the woman to be classed with as a group, to, to, to use them to actually serve the state's purpose. So I would rather prefer we are individuals. We are individual women. So I can agree with the libertarian feminism, but not that they left the meaning feminism, basically they want to class a woman. Doesn't matter what you want. You know, doesn't matter what you want, what you choose to do, we should all do basically a certain social political agenda they want us to do. It's like it just means no. It's like a, I don't belong to any class. I want to be truly free center independent woman. I do whatever I want. But if men treat me in any way without respect and without dignity and betray me, it's like a take a hike, man. I don't need you. <laughs> and I'm oh, sure my husband does that. <laughs> That's why we married for 26 years, but I don't understand. Why so many women in this this country I call them battered woman syndrome? I mean they of course some voters act like that. You can be her, oh he just uh, he lost his temper, but you give her tomorrow. He apologized, he promised. You do that for ten years, he still abuse you. You know, it's like a, I, I don't understand where this comes from as Western woman. Why can't you become truly independent? And of course independent does not mean, you know, you will be living singly, you don't need a man, you always want to challenge man to come competitive kind of person. No, I'm talking about in your in your soul, in your mind, and in your financial situation. You know, some women, their wife, their husband divorced them at 60 years old. The woman even don't know how to write a check. I, I met that woman in, at my workplace, you know, 10 years before. It just amazed me. It's like, how come they never learned how to be living independently with a man to do anything? Some women don't know how to pack when they travel. They don't know how to pack their suitcase. Their husband have to pack for them. It's like, are you kidding me? You know, ask my husband. I don't want him to touch my suitcase. <laughs> you know, I do my own packing. I know where my stuff is. <laughs> and also, you gotta prepare. If your husband needs you, tragedy happens in life. You know, you know, some rich women renown their husband for all their financial support. Tragedy happens. Those women don't know to do squat in life. They even don't know how to fight court, protect their rights, and the assets. It's like a, then they have no paycheck to pay bills and, and running down the assets very quickly. I think to be but truly free individuals, you have to be truly independent in all situations, right? I mean, that's how I exchange my information on family with you. I don't like some families go too far cross borders become unisex people. You don't know if they're male or woman anymore, you know? But I think uh, uh, in, in China, we were supposed to dress, talk like boys, not to be like girls. And I like to keep my feminine, you know, feminine, then how do you say that word? Yeah, I want to be pretty, I still want to look sexy, I still want to be like, and the people were, you know, pick on me once so a while, it's a compliment. You say, look, you are sexist, oh my god. It's like, I said to you, yeah, if it throws me, I'm my friend back, and I think that's fun. But to tell me, oh, yes, I'm a with man, if you throw with me, as man, I'm going to punch your nose. It's like, what kind of life do we have? I think I have gone too far from the left side. But I, I have not gone into the turn of this movement yet, so I'm glad to meet you today. We're going to keep our conversation. So right. <laughs> but the true feminism, I think it's all up to individual, how you interpret it, how you see it. But I want every individual to lead a very free life. Be truly yourself. I don't want to be classified into groups. That's how I see it. I live under the Confucianism, I hate it. I live under communism, I hate it. 
So now I'm a libertarian. So I, that's why I say that nobody can ever, ever control me again. So that's my perspective. <laughs> Like these three women 
the most influential people in our in our in the founding of our party, even though Ayn Rand really hated libertarians. The fact <laughs> is people become libertarians through Ayn Rand all the time. They read out literature. My brother's name is Ragnar because my mother really liked that. <laughs> um, so uh, I was almost Dagny, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> But the fact is that there are, there, you know, and Tony Nathan was our VP, and John Hoskins was gay. We have all sorts of diversity. We have, there's a lot of, of, of uh, there's a lot of people, especially early in the movement, that were, that were, uh, that were women, or black, that were gay. But the fact is, yes, they have been minorities within the party. But I started to do some polling, and I'm actually still working on it, but I got about 900 responses so far, and the next thing I'm doing is, I'm, I'm pulling women to find out why they are libertarians, and I'm pulling women and men to find out why they're not. And the key there is that I ask men and women why they're not. Because if I get a data point that says that women women aren't libertarians, like if, I, if I poll women and I say, hey, why aren't you a member of the Libertarian Party? Why aren't you a libertarian? And they answer, they can answer all sorts of questions. They gave a whole multiple choice list. I said, what do you disagree with on libertarianism? And let's say a lot of them say, I think we need to have a social state. You know, that, that confirms a lot of things that people think about women and libertarianism. But if I ask men the same question, I see practically the same response. There's no some safety net. We need to help people. That's, like, that's the safety net is, is across the board, not just feminine. It's every issue. Every, yeah. Everybody in this room is forced to be Asian for the meat. We don't care about safety. Right. But everybody has a safety net. The key is to reach them is to make them come to the realization of a safety net based on human compassion yeah. is superior to a safety net exactly. with cracks when you fall through no one gives a shit. Exactly. You had a uh, so I, I have an opinion on feminism and I'm obviously not a female, but um, the thought that I don't often see is that feminism is usually how can we include women in men-ish things or that are traditionally male um, my opinion is how can an entity change to be more female? Um, how can it have more of a, a female um, effect, whatever that, that is? Because I think there is a sort of a difference. Like, I actually see, I'm new to the Libertarian Party, and I kind of see that sometimes the message is very masculine, or what would be typically a masculine message. It's, it's very like, here's my guns, you know, don't take my guns away. I want now, guns and weed. I don't give a crap about anything. Yeah, yeah, I mean, whatever. That could, that maybe maybe that's what women think as well. But to me, a newcomer, maybe that sounds masculine. Exactly. Exactly. So my question to you is, if you had an influx of women, and say the party was 50-50, how do you see the party changing? Would it have a different dynamic? Maybe a softer a softer stance. I don't know if that's being sexist by no, saying that. I, I think um, that. I think that women are going to have a lot of different different motivations, different you know preferences. A, a woman who, I mean, and the thing is, everyone's life experiences are going to create issues that they care about, right? So I'm a woman who doesn't have any children. As a result, typically, like I care about you know when it comes to freedom to homeschool one's children, freedom in um, in reproductive rights, not just abortion rights, but the fact is that there are lots of of issues in which the state comes between women and deciding how best to give birth to their child, and how best to raise their child, and when best to vaccinate their child. There are many ways in which the state imposes upon parenting. But I'm a woman who's not a parent, so yes, I care about those liberty issues, but those aren't the biggest ones for me. What, what am I? I'm like the little Miss Corporate, like I'm, I'm, I work in a startup, and I'm constantly going, wow, I live in California, and I work at a startup, <laughs> and I handle like I do operations of a startup. And what that means is that I spend a lot of time looking at what we pay in taxes. I look at what we have to pay when I pay a minimum wage employee and I'm getting to know them and see what their talents are before offering them a job that can pay them better. I have to, you know, the, the, the um, <coughs> California just moved their minimum wage up from $10 an hour to $11 an hour. And I see how that affects the bottom line. And so, like, I'm, I'm a woman who, you know, I'm looking at my paycheck and I'm seeing money come out of it and that's what I care about. But every single person, their life experiences are going to determine what they mostly care about. And so, yes, with more women in the party, we would see uh, we would see more issues come up. And again, it would be about more people being able to express the different things that we 
value and to have more people that can speak on that, to more people that can say, I'm a mother who wants to homeschool my children and new regulations have been created to make that hard to do. And they'll see people who, you know, who can talk about you know, all the different things that women and men can care about. Um, but the thing that I find interesting is I think the libertarian movement has grown and if there's not just a party, there's the movement itself. Organizations like Students for Liberty, Young Americans for Liberty, and um, and the number of groups. We also have um, ladies, uh, the Lady, ladies of Liberty Alliance, as well as the National Organization of Libertarian Women. Um, there's so many groups um, out there that are spreading liberty messages in different ways. That SFL and YAL are not specifically the Libertarian Party. They're just they're just organizations of libertarianish students, you know, who are who are uh, who are trying to bring. Uh, liberty to young people and get them more involved. And those kids aren't necessarily getting involved in the Libertarian Party. But we're seeing influxes. I go to ISFL season, like the big conference every year, and there are more and more young women, and they're excited, and they're bringing in more women. And then Jug White takes a bunch of pictures of everyone looking like they're having a fun time, and there's lots of women in those pictures, and suddenly other women are looking and going, hey, there's other women, that's my friend, I totally want to go to that next year, that looks like fun. And the fact is, it becomes more appealing. And so I started doing my polling, and I started to see what people, what what drives women to become libertarians or not be libertarians. What drives men to become libertarians, and what not, and, and if they haven't. And then I'm actually pushing this poll out to more non-libertarians, because I feel like my data is a little skewed at the moment. But eventually I'll release this. But one of the things that I've noticed is, I also looked up current participation rates. Now one, I think it's pretty crazy that most libertarian organizations do not actually track the demographics of their own, like their own membership. And I know that like a lot of us don't like to do like filling out these things and say like, I'm white and I'm not whatever. But, but the fact is, is that if you don't know how many women you have in your party or the Free State Project or whatever group you're part of, you can't, you can't see Okay, do we have 10% women? And did over like 10 years, did we go up to 20% women? And why was that? But as I've been watching this, I see that different organizations, like Students for Liberty, is ten, it tends to be kind of a, like they're known as being friendlier to the left. And they seem to have a higher percentage of women. On the, on the YAL, they're typically a little bit more Republican. There's actually, there's not, they're not, uh, they're not very off from SFL. But again, that's also dealing with the younger generation. And millennials are considered the most politically independent generation in the country. I'm a millennial right here. And, um, and we're considered the most politically independent generation in the country. We, we have that kind of, we're very socially tolerant. Hey, like, we love the gig economy, and that's a big one. Is the, the gig economy, Uber, things like that are really going to bring, bring a lot of people towards liberty. But the, the last point that I wanted to make on that was simply that Libertarianism, what I found was interesting is that most of the organizations that I looked at had about 20 to 30% women. And I see a lot of women in leadership roles. When I was vice chair of the Libertarian Party in New Hampshire, we had six, six executive board members at the time. Seven. Yeah, there were six and half of them were women. It was Sandy, me, and Faith. I think there were three, there, were, there was half of them were women. Um, the former president of the Supreme State Project was Carla, I can never pronounce her last name, I totally doubt about that. Carla? No, Carla, if you were, was it? Kirecki. Sorry, Carla, if you've ever seen this on that little thing. Okay. Um, but, uh, but, you know, woman running an organization, right? And then we, we see we, we see women in, in leadership roles, which is kind of the thing Daniel was referring to, was like, do we do all the work? There are a lot of women doing a lot of amazing work for this party. I would have to agree with that. Yeah. I, I see some of these women coming in and taking charge of the things and um, actually getting the price of them. Absolutely. And so the last thing was that I looked up, I asked a lot of libertarian news organizations, Reason, B, um, TLR, um, and a number of other libertarian insights, what their female leadership was, because they all have Google Analytics. And my, my day job is that I work in advertising, monitoring Google Analytics. So I love analytics data. This is me. I'm like, ooh, I want to know exactly what you got for, for, for female viewers and, and, and in what demographics. And so I actually asked, and completely fascinated me, was both B and uh, the Libertarian Republic have 40% female readership, which is actually pretty high because in most news organizations have over 50% male readership. And so, like, I think Mother Jones is one of the only ones that has more women reading it than men. 
also has more women reading it than men. But the fact is, like TLR gets 1.5 million unique views a month, and 40% of them are women. Women checking out libertarian issues. Maybe they're not coming to the party. Maybe they're not coming to SFL. Maybe they're members of those organizations and we don't know it. Or maybe they're just checking us out because somebody posted something interesting. But it's fascinating to see that there's more interest about gun issues is about men 
Master Isha, have you seen me with my AR-15? <laughs> <laughs>
Actually, I become more famous after I stopped running as Kennedy. I was fighting Kennedy poor because, you know, my, my China education. And today, more and more people are waking up, including Democrats who are teachers who supported Democrats. It's like, oh, they're just like Republicans. They sold us out. They sold the base out. Because now all the money and gave to our election campaigns and, and you know, gave to the states and all that. Now they start to say, maybe we shouldn't touch that money. So I think this is a moment to go in that we can maybe really try to abolish, you know, the problem of education because, uh, you know, the money they give to the state now that they're becoming basically hey, so much money come with it. The teachers, all teachers are retiring because they hate to, they cannot do this to their kids, they make them study, teach to the test, kids are crying, and, and the parents cannot keep, uh, help their kids with masks because they don't understand that crazy coming for masks. You know, it's like they do this on purpose or something, so you, you cannot help your kids mess anymore. You know, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and uh, so I think of this issue, I've been fighting for a top of my issue. Who do you like, you know, people from both sides get together? Uh, because no longer parties an issue, you know. I, I, some of you, if your grandparents, you don't understand what you for, uh, and look into it and, and then pull the kids out or something. I think homeschool probably now is the best solution, just until we get rid of this. So, a man's here to stop the talk. So, anyway, <laughs> so that will kind of segue into what the next topic is going to be. The next topic is going to be, and by the way, thanks to Adam O'Brien and to so much. <laughs> myself do a lot of lobbying in the Louisiana legislature, um, and so I'm going to turn it over to, the, to the, those guys, and what do you want to say to that? We are, I want, before you guys leave, you guys are here for the, the ladies or the women's um, discussion. Um, for those of you who, if I'm, 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 I'm not going to I'm going to bring more people over in a second. Um, so much, and I, I agree with your findings, that there are women in the military movement. Would you guys happen, the, the ones who have attended um, conventions in the past, did it feel like it was women at this convention? Yes. 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 Y